many times when I talk with people about how to address racial injustice, we get stuck on token gestures. To see unity in the church, we must push past these surface level changes and move toward deeper, more challenging transformations. In this session, we're going to look at the way Paul engaged the issue with Titus. In order to address the injustice Titus was facing, Paul didn't resort to token gestures. He gave of himself, becoming an advocate who was willing to endure the conflict and scrutiny of his own tribe for the sake of another. In this discussion, JD and an all-white panel talk about how to lead well as a white leader in the current culture and what it might look like to truly push past the token gestures and become an advocate for others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that as we have this conversation that it will be clear, that it will be helpful, that it will be gospel-centered, and that the things we say will be true. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, well, thank you all for joining uh, me here. One of the original ideas of this was it might be good to have a couple sessions where we just talk sort of amongst ourselves, you know, in particular ethnicity and how we're contributing or not contributing well to the conversation. Um, you know, one of the things we notice is that in a situation that was ethnically charged, that involved Titus and um, uh, forcing him to conform to certain habits of Jewish habits, that Paul did not make Titus, you know, advocate for himself. Paul did not merely post something on social media and, and move on. Paul took this case on as his own. And uh, he also went straight to the, to, the, to the power place in the church, which would have been the council and with Peter, and that's where he did his confrontation. Um, without trying to press the analogy too far, you know, here we are, and in a sense, in I guess you would say the American church, that those who hold most of the levers of power are going to be uh, people in, historically in the white community. And, and so we find ourselves in a position where, like Paul, it seems from Galatians that we want to advocate for and, and come and, and talk. That's what this conversation is. That's where it comes out of Galatians too. Um, so the question I, I think we should just ask, and I'll throw it out as, as baldly as I can here, um, why do um, African-American brothers and sisters and other people of color, why, why do we think that it, they find it difficult to be a part of of our churches, our churches, you know, or in our church culture, so to speak. Mm. Vance, let me start with you. Because Vance, I know you've had a lot of work and a lot of success by God's grace in seeing a church grow in multi-ethnicity. Well, I've learned a lot. Um, you know, I'm a white guy from Alabama that 20 years ago, God relocated to Las Vegas, Nevada to plant a church. And I grew up in an all-white church in Alabama. Um, now I'm a part of a church with 54 languages in Las Vegas. So it was not on my radar. I didn't know what I was getting into when I went there. Um, but I don't know that I can answer the question exhaustively, but I think two, two insights for sure. One I've learned over the course of years and one I've learned just in the last few weeks, to be honest with you. But the one I've learned over the course of years is that a lot of times when we talk about churches today being multicultural, what we're really talking about is churches being multicolored. Mm -hmm. We want different colors of people to come to the church, but the church is still going to function predominantly in one homogenous culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still going to be philosophically, strategically, from a worship standpoint, even though there are multiple colors of people there. And at best, we might put some different colors of people on the stage, but we're still singing music from one culture. For a church to truly be multicultural, there must be shared ownership in strategy, philosophy, planning, structure, um, vision, so that multiple cultures are speaking into that, which means in a multicultural church, everybody's going to be uncomfortable at some point mm -hmm. because what you see taking place is- Including a, the pastor? Including <laughs> the pastor. Mostly the And if you want me to, I can tell a story about that if you want me to. But, um, uh, it, it's very uncomfortable because there's a collision of culture taking place. Now, what comes out of that is a more pure expression of the gospel, but there's a collision of culture that takes place because I believe convictionally, we don't see the full image of God in humanity until we see Revelation 5, all cultures together with this full expression of the Imago Dei. Um, but I think one of the reasons some minorities, African-Americans in particular, struggle to come into uh, our traditional churches is because even though we want to be multi 
cultural, it's really more about being multicolored. We have different colors, but we don't allow the freedom of their cultural expression in our churches, and there's something beautiful about that when it comes together in worship. The second thing that I've learned recently, particularly about African Americans, in light of the current tragedies we've just walked through in our country, is it's a much greater price for an African American to be a part of a multicultural church than it is for any one of us as white people. It's a much greater cost. I said a minute ago, it's uncomfortable for everybody. But for us, we live in a society where we're very seldom uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We don't go in a store and have security follow us around. We don't get extra checked uh, when we walk out of a store to make sure we have receipts. We don't get pulled over. Uh, and so all the things that our black brothers and sisters face out in society, we don't face in society. So church is the, multicultural church is the only place of discomfort for us. For the African-American Christian, the black church. It used to be the refuge. It was the oasis in the desert. It right. was the one place they could be black, yeah. be Christian, and be themselves. Everybody understood, everybody had the everybody, same questions. Everybody got it. For them to come to the multicultural church, yeah. they're giving up the only place in society they had to be themselves. Yeah. Mm. And choosing. So um, in moments like we're walking through right now, as a multicultural church, we have to give sensitivity to this because our brothers and sisters in Christ are feeling something they're hurting. that we don't feel. And so that's two reasons why I think yeah. it's it's challenging for for minority culture to be, to come into our churches. Yeah, a couple things there. One is you know I think the theory for a lot of people in the majority culture of a multicolored church is beautiful. It is right. They want to. We always say they want multicultural events. Yeah, but they don't want to live multi ethnic lives. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther King used to say that the most segregated hour in America was 11 to 12 on Sunday. But if I, I would not want to be in a, ever try to improve on that, but uh, he said, I mean, yeah, I think one other more segregated hour is, you know, six to seven every night around the dinner table. And because we don't live those kind of lives, we don't have those kind of events. But most of them, they, they want the event without the price you have to get there. And part of that you were talking about is assimilation, um, you know, just like of, Hey, we want you to come in, but but adopt our culture. I've had people in our church, very well-meaning uh, people, say, "Man, I just wish we saw more color out there." Then turn around and complain. Yeah. The next week, I mean, not even like just a few days later, <laughs> about why well, I didn't like it when the worship leader was trying to get us to put our hands in the air. And I'm not trying to use stereotypes, but it's something they were uncomfortable with. Yeah. And you're like, I, I don't think you understand really what you're asking for. It, it makes sense to you for the photograph, but but to really do this. And that ties to the second thing, which is that willingness to share power in ways that will change the, yeah, the, right. the, the culture. Uh, you know, to say, all right, what, is it, what does it look like when this person is leading and helping shape this decision? I, I experienced it one time um, myself just, uh, you know, going into, I went to a, was, uh, visited an all, all black church, for a large church and in our area, and I, I wouldn't even mentally paying attention, like I, I, I wasn't consciously thinking of this, but I noticed how uncomfortable I felt. And I remember later thinking like, I don't know why I felt so uncomfortable, but if one white person had walked on stage, I would have felt like, okay, you know, like, and I just realized, I was like, this is how people of color, I think, feel quite often in our church, mm -hmm. or when the only one we, you know, only person of color we have is on the praise team, or something like that, you know. And I think it's it's to say, hey, we're serious about this. We don't just want black faces or brown faces. We want their voices, their leadership. We want them shaping into it, and and, and that. So, and I, I think JD, that has to be modeled at the top. I, I think you model it, Vance. I've watched you, um, Jimmy, both model it. Donna models it very very well. Her and Steve at Bellevue. Um, I, I do think, and it's more than just a slogan and more than just a cliche, I'm gonna throw another one out, but it, I, the tongue in your mouth and the tongue in your shoe have to go the same direction. You have to walk your walk, you have to talk, you can't just preach it and not demonstrate it. So it gives credibility, it's some street cred to when you're talking about it, that they're saying, our pastor's not just saying, y'all, y'all, y'all ought to try to, he's saying, listen, this is gonna get messy for all of us, but I'm not gonna ask you to do anything that I'm not gonna do. My granddaughter's black, so she's at a store. It's kind of a high-end store. She's with her mom, 
we would have never seen it and never had experienced it, except we, we watched. She's walking around looking at clothes and now the security starts coming around her. She picks up a blouse and says, Mom, says to my daughter, what do you think about this? And she says, oh, let me see that, Precious. And she walked towards her and they said, oh, are you all together? I said, yes. Oh, oh, okay. Mm. We would have never known that. Mm. And, and, and having dialogues through the turmoil that in the tumultuous times of walking in with blacks to have them say to you, Pastor Ken, do you know what it's like when you're walking down the street and you hear doors lock? I just go, no, I, I, I really don't. So I, I think I, I think that it's not ever to be token. I don't think that's the goal. The goal here is not to be a non-racist. That's not the goal. That's not our goal here. Our goal is to speak the gospel and to stand up for anyone who is opposing the gospel in those way that gives a different picture than who our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is. You know, it's, it's amazing too how God bursts a passion in your heart and maybe 20 years later, yeah. <laughs> he brings it to fruition. But when we were in college, I was an education major. I told Steve that I'm gonna start schools. I'm going after kids. You know, and it would be 30 years later, God would move us to Memphis and I would start going into the inner city. And it was literally just one morning as I was praying over the city that in my spirit, I heard so loud, this is your city, these are your children. What are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. Because I'm supposed to love my neighbor mm -hmm. like I love myself. Mm -hmm. And we've got 15 grandchildren. I would not be able to sleep mm -hmm. if my grandkids had a subpar education and went to bed hungry. Yeah. And so God just began to really open my eyes mm -hmm. to the need in our city and then to challenge our people to see it and to respond because the greatest command God's given us is to love Him and then to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Amen. The greatest command is for our greatest good mm -hmm. because it is when I love Him with my whole being that sin loses its grip. Mm -hmm. I no longer prejudge, which is prejudice mm -hmm. people for the color of their skin or their socioeconomic status, but I'm coming alongside them, loving them like I would love my own children, yeah. my own grandchildren. What do I want them to have? I want these children to have that. And I think that's the beauty of what we're talking about here. It is the love of Christ, the gospel lived out. Mm -hmm. When are we going to stop just talking about mm -hmm. it and actually start living it? That's when the lost world will stand up and take notice. Yeah, that's beautiful. Can I ask, ask a follow-up question? Absolutely. How is How is Bellevue as a church, how have you seen your church change as a result of your integration? We have become that? much more multi-color and slowly getting more multicultural. <laughs> I would say. One of the lead pastor's wives, Beverly Stevens, called us to repentance, but she called us to reconciliation without resolution. She said, you're not going to be able to resolve all of the issues, but we are reconciled Amen. in Christ. Yes, we are reconciled in Christ. So I scheduled a Zoom with those women to get on there, three black, two white, and said, okay, tell me how you're processing this. Mm -hmm. Tell me how your church is processing this. How can I pray for you? I want to learn. I want to be able to see through your eyes. That's empathy. Yeah, That's is. learning how to come alongside someone and bear their burden and share it with them in prayer and be mm -hmm. an encouragement. And that's how we learn. I don't see in scripture that all the disagreements of opinion in the early church or even among the disciples necessarily got resolved before they had unity. Right. Like unity did not depend on uniformity. Right. And a lot of, you, you can just read, whether it's Romans 14 talking about how to eat meat with idols or Acts 15 that we've referenced to or Galatians 2, there was a lot of different life practices. You know, we you know, pointed out in the last Undivided that two of Jesus's um, disciples, one was called Simon the Zealot, yeah. the other was called Matthew the Tax Collector, right. which if nothing else tells you they were on opposite sides yeah, of yeah, one of the most sure. pressing political questions. And there's nothing that said that Jesus like converted them both to the right view. Right. They, they continued on with that difference of perspective, but the unity they had in Christ yeah. was enough that they could sit around the campfire and discuss like, well, you think this and I think yeah. that, but you know what? That's okay, because we really agree on this over here. And it, 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 it's, it almost makes me wonder, Donna, if it's not that our political 
our political distinctions and our cultural distinctions are so important. It's that the gospel is so unimportant to us. You're exactly right. Which is why that leads We've us to... We've allowed those other things to become preeminent instead of Christ. Right, and our message has been more of a, here, here's our culture and here's our politics rather than here's our Jesus. Yeah. That's right. Well, I was just going to say something Donna said made me, triggered this thought in me, but... Um, I mean, we're, we're the, the session of this that's all white people sitting around a table talking about this. And what's unfortunate is a lot of white churches in America are talking about multicolored or multicultural churches like it's this new novel thing in the church, <laughs> like we talked about the church growth movement or the secret church, or now it's the multicultural church. And what's, what's sad about that is we for so long have read the Bible and not seen the reality of the scripture. Multicultural church is not a new way to do church. It's the New Testament church. Right. Right. And in the book of Acts chapter 2, when the gospel started in Acts 2, 15 language groups on day one in the early church. By the time you get to Acts 13, the first church in the Gentile, among the Gentiles in Antioch, you have five elders appointed in that church. Two were from, uh, two were from I think, Africa. One was from the Mediterranean, one from the Middle East, and one from Asia Minor. So you had five elders in the first Gentile church, all multicultural. The first problem in the church was not a theological problem. It was a cultural problem in Acts 6. The Hellenistic Jews and the, the main Jews were arguing over widows. Almost every letter in the New Testament, we're looking at Galatians. Here's Galatians, and it's addressing cultural issues. When you take the gospel to a city, the church becomes a reflection of the city. The problem is we've begun to establish churches around the church instead of the gospel. We've started a church service and we've built a church service around a style and a structure rather than with the gospel engaging a city and letting the church become a reflection. So I think for a lot of us as, as, as white leaders in, in, in the evangelical world, we gotta ask the question, if our church is not a reflection of our city, not every church is going to have 50 languages, but it ought to be a reflection of the city. If our church is not a reflection of the city, what are the missiological problems with our church that we're right. not taking the gospel to the city? Because you don't see in Acts, they didn't go in and plant like the First Baptist Church of the Jews on one side of Absolutely. the city and First Baptist of the Gentiles. The gospel went to the city. Which is how it would be in our cities. That's right. That's they, exactly. they planted isn't one that, church. Isn't that what Jeremiah says in 29? Isn't that what God told Jeremiah? Pray for the shalom of the city. Yeah. You're going to be there. You're captive. Now don't. And there was this, a group of people that said, "No, come over here by the the river of Shabar because you know we're only going to be here two years." A false prophet. No, no. He said, "You're going to be there seventy years." Now here's what I want you to do: marry, have kids, pray for the shalom of the city, invest into the city. If we're going to lead our people to be people loving right. Jesus, people of any race, of any color, of any ethnicity, then we have to be people that models it and demonstrates it. And it, it has to be not a photo op. It has right. to be genuine. They smell it. They can tell. And then we have to also exegete the Word of God with justice where it comes up, righteousness when it comes up, justice when it comes up. And we have to speak to it. Yeah. You have to speak to that CEO about an opportunity of saying, did everybody get a chance? Yeah. I, I, I think you just have to, th that's integrity. Then they realize, you know, you got yeah. my back, Pastor. So, so here's what I've, I've heard, just uh, listening. In answer to the question, like, what, how, how are we supposed to be the advocate the way that Paul was? Or how do we fail to be, maybe a way of saying is, I think what we've identified, you started out with talking about kind of a forced assimilation as if, like, the white or majority culture is, is that's what the standard, you've got to come into that. We talked about a lack of empathy in certain situations and how to, to grieve with people and understand that from their perspective or to rush to solutions. We've talked about a lack of leadership, like real shared leadership in this um, and some of the leadership that we have even really being in the token category. Um, we've talked about a lack of proximity, you know, that, that caused whether it's suspicion or just not understanding or stereotypes, you know, heard that. And um, and then, uh, you know, right, what you brought up there at the end, Ken, is, is really just a failure to preach the whole counsel of God. Well, you kind of started it to say, this is not a new concept and this is ought to be normal. And um, because we talk about, uh, in a previous session, you talked about righteousness versus preaching justice and preaching these things. So I, I think that's a good start on the list. Anything else that you, you would say that, that is really necessary for an advocate for us to... Well, I just think I just think working through as, as Vince pointed out the, with the New Testament, all the way through the New Testament, the 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 Book of Acts and the Epistles 
are all showing you, giving you an inside glimpse on how the New Testament church was actually working through some of these same issues. Right, right. So, and you get inside conversation, like hidden cameras in the room kind of stuff, yeah. where they're where they're where they're kind of showing you what it felt like. Because they were at, trying to ask the question, how Jewish do you have to be to be a Christian? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the the Gentiles were asking the question, and the the Jews were asking the question, right. and even the council that they had, right. they're trying to answer the question: How Jewish? Because they're all from the same culture. There's no meat eating questions. That's in right. A, in a homogenous the culture. The whole there. thing. You just right. read. You start. If you see through that lens, it's all through the New Testament, and so it shouldn't be shocking to us. And so this is why you know we started with why do we think that some uh, uh, black people have a hard time attending our church? Because I think they're trying to figure that question out too, and so are our white churches. Mm-hmm. How white do you have to be? Mm-hmm. In order to be to be accepted as a believer, how white do you have to be in order to kind of integrate into this church? How white do you have to be to have a voice and lead in this church? And the answer should be for us, same as it was in the New Testament, not white at all, yeah. right? It's, it's gospel. And so I think just us being self-aware that this is how people are perceiving us. Yeah, that's good. But if their heart is closed to opening to other people of other races and nationalities, their heart is not really open to the gospel. And I would even have to say, can you even claim to be a believer? Right. Because love depicts a believer, a real follower of Jesus Christ. So if I'm gonna value my comfort more than I value a person, Yeah. Yeah. I got a lot of heart checking. But the church has to lead. We can no longer sit back, Mm. we can no longer be apathetic. We have to take the lead. And I think as believers, you guys know this, but we have allowed the social media cancel culture to enter Christianity, mm-hmm. to our shame, mm-hmm. to our shame. Because we should be leading the way on social media and every other means to love others, to an honor prefer one another, and not to cancel people out, but to try to find grounds to agree so that we can move forward in the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Well, and I think if we're gonna, you know, we're talking about being an advocate, um, we've gotta have skin in the game, mm-hmm. you know. Um, we are, I think it was actually in Derwin Gray's book where he pointed out a study that Duke University did. You appreciate this, JD, mm-hmm. there in your hometown. Uh, but that in the in the average in America, in the average community, the local church uh, is twenty times less integrated than the local school mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. same community. So you go, wow. you drop in a community, you go to a local church, go to a local school. Local school will be twenty times more integrated than the church. Wow. You can't be like that and be an advocate. Right. You can't have a voice and sit on the sidelines and call the plays. The church, the white church by and large sat this out in the 60s and it's why we don't have a voice today. Were it not for the African American church, there wouldn't have been a civil rights movement. It wasn't the white church that drove that, it was the African American church that drove that. And so for us to have a voice, we we have to start with repentance and recognizing the, the gospel narrative teaches us that multicultural church is the biblical model. Amen. The church being a reflection of the community, to whatever degree the society is, is diverse, the church has to be a reflection of that. And if it's not, it starts in repentance. It starts in the leadership repenting, and it starts with intentionality to build different systems and structures as, a, as, a, as an organization so that we become a reflection of the community. And we have to because if we don't, What we're doing is we're misrepresenting the kingdom to the city. One of the reasons a lot of people aren't looking to the church today for the answers, they look at the church and go, y'all ain't got it figured out because that church is white and that church is black and that church is brown. How can you help us? You can't Mm -hmm. fix this. Mm -hmm. But when they're able to look at the church and see the kingdom, to see people of different cultures, different perspectives, different worldviews together in one family with one father, we begin to represent the kingdom of God to the city and it opens up doors for conversations that lead to gospel conversations. But right. and, and if the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home, then we've got to ask ourselves, when we look at Revelation 7, God's already given us a picture of every tongue and every tribe and every every people group, and they're gonna be around the throne. He gave us that as anticipation uh, for the kingdom of God, and so we have already know what it's supposed to look like. So what you're saying is not sociology, right. it's not anthropology, it's theology, yeah. because Acts 17, 26 says he's made from one blood 
every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times, pre times and their boundaries of their dwellings. That's the sovereignty of God. Right. For you to deny that is denying the sovereignty of God that has placed right. our neighbors. And what we've said throughout this is for reasons of evangelism, churches really ought to reflect the diversity of their community. Yeah. For reasons of gospel clarity, they need to proclaim the diversity of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. It was true of the churches in Acts. Even if you go back and study in you know, the first couple centuries, um, Rodney Stark, the church historian, identifies some, some things that catalyzed church growth. And one of them was it was the only place in the empire where people of different socioeconomic classes and people of different races came together and treated one another and greeted each other with a holy kiss. That's the big impact of that verse. When somebody's in the master class is kissing someone that is you know, formerly a slave, or the, at that point, it's like they're equal. Mm -hmm. and, and it was tearing down all those things. And he says that was what led to this awakening. I wonder, and this is why I feel like it's such a gospel issue. I wonder if some of the awakening we're all praying for yeah. will happen, at least in large part, through this gospel answer. In the same passage here is Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. So he's saying, humility, I'm crucified with Christ. Give up this card of superiority. You, we, there's no place at the cross for that, for us in a white church, even if you can't, it, it, you don't have the possibilities of being multi-ethnic. There still is a place where we submit ourselves to each other, we humble ourselves, and that's a spirit that has to come from our pulpits, come within our leadership. Right. We have to model that, Right. And, uh, and I think it catches when we do that. Well, I think we've already gotten this stuff out here, but let's just end with this question then. So I'm a pastor, I'm a white pastor, church leader, and I'm saying, what, do I, what practically do I do? What would we say were some of the first steps to going out of this ser video series, Undivided, into, into practical change? Well, I mean, obviously you can care. I mean, you can start somewhere by just saying, I'm gonna care about all the people in my city or in my neighborhood, mm -hmm. all of them. Which means if you're gonna start to care, you can learn so you can find out there's things that you don't know about things that are going on, things that have happened in the past, that'll help you care. And then I think you can make a friend. Amen. Like if nothing else, can you just make a, I'm not talking about a church member. Right. I'm talking about, can you just make a friend that's different? Mm -hmm. if, uh, if most of your friends look like you, make a friend who doesn't start. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just start one friend. I mean, it changes so much. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the key. For me, when I was just thinking over this and reflecting this morning, it's intimacy with the Lord. If I'm walking intimately with him, I'm going to have his heart. And then I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to reach out to somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't look like me so that I can develop a relationship with them and learn from them, come alongside them, walk with them as a friend. And then there's going to be incremental change in my life <laughs> and in the life of the church that I have influence over. And it is one relationship at a time, one conversation at a time. And as we do that, I'm changed. Yeah. I'm changed That's by good. those relationships. That's good. Yeah. As a pastor, I think you could go see your mayor and say, where where would you like us? We want to make you look good. Forget his political affiliation or hers. Where would you send an army? When we ask our mayor that, they sent us in a pretty tough section of town and said, this this place right here. Because our city is our responsibility, right. our it, town. This is right. Jeremiah 29. That's, exactly that's right. Pray that's right. for the shalom right. of the city. That's right. Yeah, well... I hope that this conversation will at least spark some, uh, the conversations that have to take place over a long time because this is not something that happens in a, a violent right. jerk. It happens right. with a prolonged pull over time. Right. And I think that's what we gotta be committed to.